right, hey there church. I hope you got your beverage of choice. You're ready to rock this study with me. i um, excited to do this because we're back in the book of Isaiah this week. Last week we looked at the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and we looked at how not to be futile in our minds. And you know, we're supposed to keep our minds on what is true. Well, what is true? God's word, right? So during this time in our country, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep our mind on what is true because we're so inundated with, you know, politics or uh, ads for Christmas stuff coming up or Thanksgiving or whatever we have going on. And sometimes that stuff controls us and we allow our minds to be controlled by those things and we forget about God. We forget about his word. But we're to remember why we are placed here on this earth to understand that we're to walk with the Spirit and do the things God has called us to do on a daily basis. I was actually reading through Jonah uh, this week, and if you know Jonah at all, you know that he was called to do a very specific task. Do this. Go to the people of Nineveh and preach to them. But Jonah decided to do his own thing, and he runs from God and does the exact opposite of what he's what God's telling him to do. But I can't come down on Jonah too hard because we, I do the same thing sometimes. We, I suppress the Spirit's movement in my life when I should be living and walking with the Spirit moment by moment throughout the day, throughout uh, the days. So how do, we, how do we look at God's will for our lives? Well, he wants us, or he wants to use his children um, in his will. He wants to allow them to be part of his will and be used by him, which is an incredible honor that the king of the universe would want to use us. And quite frankly, his will is better for everyone involved, whether it's the person doing it or whether it's the person receiving the message. Everything that God wants in his will is better for everyone involved. So it's not just for you, it's not just for the hearer, it's better for everyone. So it brings us to our lesson today in Isaiah, because the people of Judah are learning this lesson the hard way. Uh, trusting that God's will is the best isn't always an easy task. And guess what? 2,700 years ago, people were struggling with it just the same. The cool part uh, about our relationship though with God is that the more we get to know him, the more we get to trust him or we will learn to trust him. We get to know him, though, by his word. So let's dive in and see what we can learn today. We're going to be in Isaiah 30, uh, 31 and 32, but we're going to start in Isaiah 30. And as I said two weeks ago, this is a grouping of chapters that are doublets. So we looked at chapter 28 and 29 where there were three woes announced. And now we look at the other half of those woes explained in much more detail. Chapter 28 started off with a woe where the people's pride was their crown. The pride in themselves had blinded them to seeing what God was doing. They couldn't or they wouldn't see what God was doing. So they made an alliance with Egypt, which we will see here in chapter 30 in great detail. Um, so let's start reading verses 1 through 4 in chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord. Who take counsel, but not in me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame and trust in the shadow of Egypt will be your humiliation. For his princes were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanez. Let's just stop right there. The idea of this, think about the shot in the face to God this is. I mean, this is wild. You're going to feel this, I promise. God, 600 years earlier, had taken the people of Israel out of Egypt. We know this as the Exodus. So this was 600 years before this event here, or before this writing. He had brought them out of Egypt to fulfill the promise that he had made to Abraham, to, and he promised it by himself to Abraham that he would give him a land. He rescues the people from Egypt, gives them the land of Israel. And what did the people do when they brought, were brought out of Egypt? They cried, 
We were better off in Egypt. God let us out here to die. And don't we often do the same thing? So God provided for them quail, manna. He guided them literally step by step, never left their side, protected them from literally everything. And here, 600 years later, the people want to return to an alliance with Egypt. What a shot in the face of God. What, do you understand the woe here now? Why there is a woe here in chapter 30? But before I get too hard on them, we do the same thing. I do the same thing. God promises that he is faithful, that he cares, that he can take care of us. And we just rely on the world for our fulfillment, our happiness, our purpose, our joy. It, it's a shot to God who loved us, who gave himself for us. We return to the world. We return to the things that used to bring us comfort. Instead of relying on God for our everything. As Psalms would say, you are our all in all. But we keep going in verses 8 through 14 here. It explains this deviation uh, from God is going to have consequences. So let's read verses 8 through 14. Now go, write it on them before... T- Write it before them on a tablet and note it in a scroll that it may be for time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceit. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wow. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose break comes suddenly in an instant, and he shall break it like the breaking of a potter's vessel, which is broken into pieces, He shall not spare. So there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take from the earth, to take fire from the earth, or to take water from the cistern. So we have here a passage where the people are literally despising God. May that not be said of us, that we will not hear the law of God, or that we are a rebellious people. Because that's what he's saying here. I mean, this is harsh. But the therefore here in verse 12 is very real. There are consequences to leaving God, to purposefully leaving God. I mean, leaving God in any way is one thing. But purposefully, to follow our own way, that seems crazy. I mean, I don't know everything. Certainly don't. God does. And yet, sometimes I... Forget him, and I go on my own way. But verse 15 through 26 here is all about God's grace. Understand, we have freedom. We can run like Jonah, right? But there are consequences. There is grace, though, in God, far greater than our sin and shame. Verse 18 says this, Therefore the the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted, that he, w- that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Wow, that's pretty cool. And, and then verses 19 through the rest of the chapter here, verse 26, describe in detail for the people of Judah exactly what the grace of God is going to look like for them. How cool is that? Isaiah describes for them what God's grace is going to look like. Then, in the last couple of verses of the chapter, they have to do with God's judgment on Assyria, verse 27 through 33. But how do we get there? What sense does that make? Okay, good question. So, Syria, Assyria is the one giving Judah problems at this point, right? They were going to go to Egypt and get help. So, we have them being taken out by God. Why is that important? Because of what we just read, the people or the leaders of Judah were going to go to Egypt for help. And God said, no, don't do that. I got this. 
He wants to take out Assyria so that all praise and honor can go to him. He does not share this with Egypt. So God wants to demonstrate his power so that they would know they could trust him. The people of Judah need to know that. But we keep going with this line of thought right in uh, chapter 31 here because the fifth woe is here. And it's connected to the second woe, right? First, fourth, second, fifth, third, sixth. So this woe is tied to the fact that people are so blind and drunk on their own wisdom, on their own power, that God will give them up to be destroyed. Jerusalem in the second woe would be destroyed because of the people following after the world. So let's start reading chapter 31 and see what happens. Verses 1 through 3. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and will not call back his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of those who work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. But when the Lord stretches out his hand, both he who helps will fall and he who is helped will fall. They will all perish together. So you're going to see here in these first three verses that all who follow the world, even Judah in this instance, will fall with the Egyptians. God will not allow them to live. This is in essence, they're going to make their bed and then they're going to lie in it. There's consequences. They, can, they, can, they do not seek the Lord according to this pa- uh, passage. They do not slash cannot recall his words. They don't even remember what God had said. It's a very ugly situation. And once again, this is one of those things where I'm like, oof, I pray that this cannot be said of us as believers, that we do not seek the words, that we can't recall the words of the Lord. And that's so sad. But we're going to see here that there is great hope for the people who do follow God. <clears throat> Jerusalem's going to be captured. We know that because of the prophecy. The people of Assyria, though, who are allowed to capture it, they're not going to revel in their victory, and they're going to lose in the end. So let's read. Let's keep reading here, verse 4 through not the rest of the chapter, 4 through 9. For thus the Lord has spoken to me, as a lion roars, as a young lion over his, pre- over his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor be disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight for Mount Zion and for its hill. Like birds flying about, so the Lord of hosts will defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will deliver it. Passing over it, he will preserve it. Return to him against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day, every man shall throw away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, sin which your own hands have made for yourselves. Then Assyria will fall by the sword, not of man, and the sword, not of mankind, shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall become forced labor. He shall cross over to his stronghold for fear. And his princes shall be afraid of the banner, says the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. God's going to fight for Zion. Why? Because he said he would. He wants to be their everything. He brought them out of Egypt and he he will deliver them again. He will not allow them to run back to the Egyptians for help. He will not allow the Egyptian people to get a foothold in his people. And Isaiah here in verse 6 really displays the focus of this entire chapter, or woe. Return to him against, return to him against the whole, whole the children of Israel have deeply devoted. I said that wrong. Return to him against whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. That's the focus right there. Repentance. That verse, if you will, if you have like the New King James or maybe an ESV or something, it's going to stand separate from the rest of the chapter in genre. 
It's not a figurative language or using imagery to describe something like the rest of the chapter is. It is a plea by the author, a narration of the chapter to this point. Return to God, he cries, against whom you have deeply revolted. So we end today with chapter 32. This is not the sixth woe. This is, in fact, a continuation of the fifth woe. But it is the end, which is therefore much more hopeful, and it looks to the future, as is Isaiah's custom here. When showing the people what was going to happen, Isaiah did not just want to deliver doom and gloom. We got to understand that. That would destroy the people. But instead, he wants a well-rounded view, view of the future. So here's what you're doing. Stop, repent, please do. If not, there's consequences. There's also hope for the future. Chapter 32 starts with the reign of a king of righteousness. Who could that be? And his reign is in verse 3. It's characterized by the people who he rules over. Interesting, huh? Because normally we would ascribe how a king reigns to what they accomplish or their great deeds. But here Isaiah is saying the reign is going to be characterized by a couple things that the people do. God's reign over his people changes people. His rule changes them. How cool. But how does he do it? There's four ways that this passage talks about. It's going to talk about perception or their eyes, reception, their ears, how they grasp things, their mind, and how they communicate, their tongue. All of these things are going to change how they take information in and how they communicate it out to others. All these things change. So let's start by reading verses 1 through 4 in chapter 32. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the wind, and a cover from the tempest. As rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, the eyes of those who see will not be dim. The ears of those who hear will listen, and the heart of the rash will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. Then in verses 5 through 8, he describes their actions being changed as well. So we have information in, information out changing, the mind is changing, and actions are going to be changing as well as you look further down in this passage. But verses, verses 9 through 14, they're a little bit harder to read in this passage, a little bit harder to understand because he addresses the women. Why? Why does he address the women here? Well, we have to go all the way back to chapter 3. And in chapter 3, he calls the women of Jerusalem out. He calls the people of Jerusalem, the women of Jerusalem out. Because he says that they are all identified by their complacency and their false sense of security. So he said that in chapter 3, and he's referring to it again here because he's addressing Jerusalem. So he addresses the women of Jerusalem embodied in characteristics that God did not want to characterize his people. Complacency and a false sense of security implies that they were lazy or inactive in their faith in God. That they were just they were just skating by, relying on things that the world offered and not taking God seriously at his word. So we have a changed people in the coming kingdom, ruled by a king of righteousness. People characterized by renewed minds and actions. People that are not lazy or complacent in this world. But then we keep, we keep reading here in verse 16 through the end of the chapter here, uh, verse 16 through 18. Um, there's, there's more. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation. Isn't that the opposite of what just characterized the women of Jerusalem? God's ways are better than ours. Have we learned that yet? Because we need to see that here. I started this lesson with a story of Jonah. He had to learn the hard way. God doesn't want us to do things his way because it's his way. We need to ensure that our mindset is in line with his, where we say, God wants us to do things his way because his way is the best way 
for everyone involved. And that's a whole changing of the mindset. You're not just doing things to do things. You're doing things because God's way is truly best for everyone involved. And that's going to save us from a lot of trouble and heartache. But we have to learn that lesson. And how you learn that lesson is up to you. Hopefully you can see it in his word here and not have to live the hard times out. You can trust God that this word will increase your faith like it's supposed to. We must, as his people, acknowledge today that we cannot rely on the world. We, what we used to be into, what used to bring us comfort and joy, that can't characterize us anymore. We must instead learn the ways of our creator and learn to please him with everything that we are. Hold nothing back. Give him everything because that's best for everyone involved. You, your neighbor, your friends, your family. It'll be better for everyone. Everyone will benefit when you are following God with all that you are. And I hope that comes across today in this passage. I love you, church. I hope this section of Isaiah encourages you as you go throughout your week. I hope you meditate on it. And if you have any questions or comments, hit me up. I'd love to chat. And until next time, have a good week. I'll be praying for you.